sont fraîches, mais vous allez voir, le week-end va nettement se réchauffer.
you budding animators who want to understand what it really takes to create an animated TV series, this session is for you. Up next, we have Florian Wagner, supervising director at Mainframe Studios, an expert character animator who has worked as a creative and animation director on projects like The Dragon Prince, The Adventures of Puss in Boots, Jake and the Neverland Pirates, Teen Titans Go, and Nickelodeon's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now make sure you jump into our live chat where you can ask any questions that you may have. Now, let's join Florian Wagner for an exciting journey into the process of directing an animated TV series. Hi there, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, Kingston 2021. I'm excited to be here and talk with you guys today about uh, how to go about directing an animated television show. Um, I've assembled a few slides to walk us through the process and I'll try to cover the uh, scope from the very beginning, uh, because one of the most uh, important points of emphasis you'll see in my slides is to make sure that you plan uh, for the scope of the project at an early stage and uh, that you go into the production prepared. So in this particular presentation, the emphasis will be not so much on the in-depth creative process, but it will be about how to go um, into controlling the details of the creative process so that the right decisions are made at the right time and the end result comes out in its strongest possible form. So let's dive right in. Um, on my first slide, we're talking about what I'm sure you're very familiar with, which is the Project Bible. That's the source of uh, inception of any project. That's where you start sharing it with your uh, potential partners and people interested in the project. But also, this is probably a tool that you're going to be using to attract uh, additional talent, to build up your crew, uh, to find collaborators. So the Project Bible really has to cover a lot of ground in its earliest stages. It's uh, going to require initial designs for the characters and the locations, very important. Often people overlook the locations part. Uh, but you want to give a general idea of what does it look like? You know, what is going to be the visual representation of the show? Because that's probably what's going to get people most excited about it at first. That's going to uh, attract the curiosity. And uh, of course, you want to set up uh, the core story of it. So what is it actually going to be about? That's the first question people will have. Um, it also has to define the, the characters that are going to be the main actors in the series. So who is it about is the question. And uh, the next question we have to answer for ourselves is our target audience. Who's it for? As a director, that's probably one of the key uh, questions you have to ask yourself because that's going to carry a lot of directorial choices. Some of the design and uh, story and uh, character description choices are often coming from a writing and producing point of view. But once uh, you ask yourself, who's it for? It's as much a production question as, as it is a direction question. So uh, that kind of steers our storytelling. If it's a preschool show, for example, very different rules apply than if you're doing something for a slightly older audience. Um, the most uh, comprehensive way to add premises is also a helpful idea because you want to get a sense of how is the storytelling in these episodes going to be? Where is the entertainment going to be? Is this going to be something that is very funny in a silly way? Is this uh, going to be something very compelling because there's a lot of action adventure elements? Is there going to, is there going to be a lot of effects um, that embellish the action? That, that will all be quite important to understand at an early stage. And so these things, along with, of course, defining some of the technical things that I'm mentioning at the bottom of the slide here, uh, will now formulate a plan for you. The plan is now, what are we actually trying to uh, create here as a show? And so I've titled this slide with plan the dive, dive the plan. I'm not a scuba diver myself, but I really love this expression that they use, uh, at least here in uh, Canada, for, for diving because it sort of uh, explains in a very simple way um, how the most uh, crucial um, part of, of going through the process of a production from start to finish is really the initial plan, right? You want to have set out on 
um, a course of action that you know is going to be successful because as a director, your most important objective is to bring the maximum value on the screen. Of course, value consists of entertainment, but value also consists of visuals. Uh, value consists of a variety of different things and value also in the end uh, will mean that you are actually able to deliver your episodes on time to your broadcaster or to whoever you partnered uh, with to produce this uh, television series. So it has to be completed on time. It cannot go beyond the budget scope of what you've set out to do. And so you have to be very careful about how to best plan this. And I've listed a few uh, points here to try and explain how to keep that in under control. Schedule and budget are very important also from a directing standpoint, not just from, from a producing standpoint. The first one, uh, outlines how you, it will immediately tell you the staffing schedule. When can you bring on collaborators, animators, storyboard artists, designers, and how, my, how long can you keep them for? Um, this is important because you have to get them at the right time, not too early, not too late. You want to make sure that you get the, 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 the value, uh, so meaning the uh, money that you're spending on these uh, resources. Uh, onto the screen as, as successfully as possible. Um, then along with that comes a plan for quotas. How much do people um, uh, have to accomplish per week, for example, in order to stay on targets? And the milestone dates will uh, explain when does this have to be delivered to somebody else? When is somebody else going to have to um, review this and give you feedback? And of course, then the deliverables. So what in the end will be delivered to say the broadcaster or uh, whichever partner? All these things are important to know beforehand so you can work your way backwards in planning out uh, each step uh, for maximum uh, success. So uh, the last thing here is a pretty lengthy point. You can see it's called the assumptions. The assumptions are something that is often overlooked in the early stages of a production, but for a director are very important because this will define certain limitations that you will have. But what I'm trying to uh, explain here in my little set of slides is that limitations can be a very beneficial thing for the creative process. If you know exactly how many locations, how many characters you're planning for, uh, you can get the maximum value out of those characters and locations during the script writing process. And you can translate that into every stage of the process, the storyboards, the animation. And in the end, you'll ensure that your animators will be able to complete the project as planned on time because you did not plan for more material to go on the screen that you had uh, time or budget for. So you can see how these things are very closely related. It's very important to do a test first. Now, this comes in, in a variety of different ways. You can either plan for having an entire episode planned, uh, planned out first and then produced. That gives everybody a certain sense of reassurance that things will come in on target and on time. Um, but uh, that's not always possible. And it's, it's become less popular over these past 10 years, I would say, because uh, people feel like a lot of time is lost on this and it, it uh, balloons the, the production costs quite a fair bit because first you ramp up for for a one uh, episode project and then you ramp back down and then you have to go back into it. Sometimes a year passes by before you go back into the, the full series production and that's not necessarily attractive. So sometimes it goes differently and you create a proof of concept. Uh, that proof of concept basically serves you as much as everybody uh, around you, all the stakeholders to try and define how are we going to best put the value onto the screen? How is the style going to be? Is this going to be a very animated piece? Is this actually going to be somewhat limited in its animation style? But the entertainment is going to be carried by the dialogue, by you know the, the, the interaction between the characters, right? These things vary from show to show. And again, you have to be very careful in planning for just the right scope so that you can get the maximum entertainment within your means, within the schedule and budget that's been given to you. So ask yourself, uh, what needs to change is one of my main points here, because you might have to change something. You might realize that if we are going to go into the full series like this, with this much animation, we might not be able um, to stay on, on schedule. 
and that could become a big problem, uh, could be a, a great source of pressure for the entire team. Um, from here on, this is still sort of um, con considered pre-production. Um, you uh, develop two different things that will be uh, real guideposts for the process. One is the style guide. The style guide will define the visual uh, clues a lot more concretely. So it will define shape, color, composition, work with the camera. So um, how are we going to put the uh, visual side of this storytelling on the screen. What is important? Um, it has to be recognizable and uh, in some ways original if it wants to set itself apart from other projects out there. And it's usually a good idea to try and aim for that. So a, a solid style guide will be a great foundation for first off creating something that is original and unique and stands out. But secondly, it will also lead to nobody being surprised by the outcome. If you share the style guide and all the visual goals that you have for the project with all the stakeholders, then there will be less surprises. And usually less surprises lead to less uh, asks for revisions or uh, retakes or reworking uh, aspects of the show. And that will, again, provide a more successful process. Beside that, you need a writer's Bible. The writer's Bible will define our characters in a more clear way. They will define arcs for the characters, if that's a possibility. Um, they will definitely define the style of the storytelling. How wacky do we want to be? It's animation, so chances are we want to get some wacky or otherwise comedic uh, entertainment out of it. But not every project is based on that. So you really want to define that because eventually you will have multiple writers working on your project, or at least the, the likelihood of that is fairly high. And you want to make sure that you get as much of a consistency in there as possible. Consistency is really going to be what defines the quality bar of your project. So consistency is for the director and the, for the producers, one of the big uh, topic, uh, one of the big topics. Uh, dialogue samples to get the flavor of the dialogue style um, implemented across different uh, scripts written by different writers, very important. And sort of a preview of the season and how what type of um, episodes it will cover, or if there is a, a through line, which becomes more and more popular now in, in animated projects as we're going to streaming platforms and we're gearing more towards binge watching type of uh, viewership. Uh, we need to have a, a project, uh, a bit of a plan, you know, where are we coming from, where are we going to over the course of the first season. So these things are going to be important. Then we go into the first stage of production, I would call it. That's when the uh, department leads join. Now, it, of course, it will depend on the scope of your production. You might have a small project, you might have a larger project. So this might not all apply to your particular case, but let's keep it in mind that in even a medium-sized production, usually here in Canada, we do think of these as individual positions that need to be covered off by certain uh, specialists. So let's look at it that way and where we want to combine things. It's always a possibility. I'm breaking it up into five different sections here. Uh, the scripts. A script editor will usually look after this consistency I was just speaking about. So that's why the writer's Bible is so important because the director can help define the writer's Bible, but then leave it to the script editor somewhat to try and keep everything consistent and on targets. And the director can start looking towards whatever uh, needs to be dealt with next. Voice casting and recording. Usually the director is very involved in that but there will be a voice director often that works directly with the actors, which is important. Actors are a very specific uh, breed of individual and they need a very careful handling. So you wanna get the most out of it. And usually it takes a skilled, um, a skilled person to, to handle that in the best possible way. Somebody who already has a, a strong connection to these actors. Then in the design realm, there will be an art director that hopefully will help implement the style guide. Same thing, you hopefully as a director had uh, uh, some sort of input on the style guide and defining the project, but now it will be in large part up to the art director to deal on a day-by-day -day basis with the designers so that you as the director are freed up and you can look at everything in equal measure. Um, storyboards is usually something you will probably be 
more involved than the other aspects. So it's kind of interesting to try and offload some of those responsibilities I mentioned before, so that you can keep your eye a little bit more on the storyboards. That's where it all starts coming together first. And so it's really important for you to make sure that all these style choices that you set out to bring to the project are being implemented. Um, and uh, there will hopefully be a story supervisor to assist you in that effort, but chances are you're going to be very involved with that. And of course, as it goes into the next stages, I'm mentioning animation here as just sort of a global general term. Um, the animation director should already start getting ahead of it and plan for the type of action, the type of acting, the type of posing and the type of expressions that are going to be, that are going to be used. If it's a a uh, project that is going to use Maya, for example, or that's going to use Flash or Toon Boom Harmony, it is always going to be a good idea to plan for an animation library, because this is something will again bring a lot of visual consistency to your project, but it will also help the animators speed up in their process. So eventually they will be very thankful to have access to walks and runs and uh, certain phonemes, certain expressions that they can take advantage of uh, when they're trying to animate their, their material. And uh, again, it will give you that consistency. When you're working with the scripts, um, you kind of now have to take keep an eye on two things. There is going to be an entertainment aspect, but there's also going to be a scope aspect here. So when the, uh, when the scripts start coming in, or when you're writing them yourself even, you want to try to plan for about one page per minute on average, but that's really a very rough average. Usually you want to try and maintain control over that by actually timing yourself out with a stopwatch while you're reading it out loud to yourself, or ideally in a table read scenario where several of you guys are sitting together and reading it together as a group out loud. Um, the dialogue alone will give you a good indication if you're going to be too long or too short. Um, it's usually more going to be a problem that you're going to have to do too much dialogue. So keep an eye out for that. If it goes above 85% of the full duration of the of the of the each episode, it might already be a problem. So then you might have to consider shortening it. It depends on how much action has to happen in your show. If it's a very dialogue driven uh, episode, not so much. But if you want to leave room for things to actually happen while somebody is not talking, you have to factor that in. So 85% for me is, a, is always a good measure. Um, and uh, talking heads is, is one of the points I'm mentioning here. Something to avoid a little bit because you always want to give business to your characters so they can express themselves. They can also move the, the storyline along uh, because it will help embellish them as, as real true individuals that have an actual life um, that uh, gives a certain sense of reality to their uh, to their everyday performance. Uh, they can be just walking while they're talking, but they can also be doing other things. You know, they might be knitting, they might be, you know, uh, working in the kitchen, they could do so anything, but it will uh, provide for a richer uh, visual experience. Again, thinking along those terms of uh, bringing value onto the screen. You're just getting more uh, valuable things to, to uh, present to the, the audience. And of course, whenever there is action, you should really think about what are you going to accompany in there for that with? Is that going to be music or is there going to be some dialogue needed? Uh, in the voice record, what is uh, a, a, an important decision early on is if you want to uh, record a group of actors together in the same room, you get a very nice and interesting dynamic out of that. So I really always appreciate that. and I, I usually prefer it. It's not always possible, especially when you have child actors, it becomes tricky uh, because young children really need to be coached quite a bit. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, if you have to plan for individual takes, it takes, it puts more burden on the director to make sure that eventually everything comes together as a lively dialogue experience. And it doesn't feel like these um, bits of dialogue were recorded in individual isolated takes. Um, and that takes some mood and activity notes from the director. It's usually a good idea to go into the voice recording session, having made these notes beside the script so that you are planning for something. Say, if a character is running while they're speaking, 
that should definitely be something that makes it into the voice performance because eventually you're going to get a richer result out of it. It's going to feel more real if you hear the voice doing the activity that the animator is going to bring to the to, to the episode. And the same is true for mood. Sometimes in the heat of doing these recordings, especially if it's fragmented in the way how it is being recorded, you can easily lose track of the actual arc that is going to be told in the episode, what type of mood the character is going through. Maybe he's feeling defeated at some point, maybe he's feeling rejected at some point, and that needs to hear, um, and it needs to be heard in the way how the character speaks. So it's definitely something you want to bring in there, some energy that has to be in there. So make yourself, uh, make some notes for yourself that is, they can help steer that. Um, and a Walla library will help you later because a Walla library is this combination of different sounds that you might not know that you're going to need while you're doing the recording for the dialogue. But eventually, when you put the animatic together, you realize, ah, he could be saying a little bit of something, or maybe he's just jumping, and I just need a bit of an effort sound here. Where am I going to take that effort sound from? So it's always a good idea to sit down and plan for just a few little effort sounds from every one of those characters, and um, a few little things that you think are going to be needed, like a yawn or you know, cough, maybe something that will eventually help you bring voice to something that is otherwise maybe a little too bland and, and lacks some sort of um, embellishment, audio embellishment. Uh, from a visual standpoint, the main model talk pack is the starting point. So here you're really going to define all of your locations and characters and props that you're going to be planning for before you really go into episodic production. So it's the, it's the main uh, array of elements that hopefully you're going to be using over and over and over again. Uh, the characters in their regular outfits and their regular costumes and all that would be a, a typical example for that kind of thing. So you want to try and go into that. Again, depends a little bit on the methodology used. If you're doing a 2D hand-drawn process, it's a little less tricky because there is no real library. There is no real asset that you can go back to. Everything has to be hand-drawn. Um, a new from scratch every, every single time, but uh, chances are you're going to be producing something based on a bills based process and then you really want to have these things in place. Uh, also, don't forget to plan for hero props. Hero props are usually things like vehicles or um, other complex machines, maybe things with uh, moving parts in it. Um, so they definitely don't just count as a regular prop. Uh, usually my rule of thumb is to count them as the equivalent of about five props um, uh, because of the, the added complexity in designing it and in building uh, this kind of item. And don't completely forget about effects either. Effects are an important part of the visual. So if there is something that's particularly frequent and recurring, that's definitely something you want to start planning for during the main model pack stage. Um, you're also at that point uh, ready to figure out the more specific instructions for the storyboard team. So you want to try and give them some clear guidelines of what to work towards. And uh, one of the mo most uh, relevant things here at this stage is the character on screen average, something that gets easily overlooked uh, when you don't pay attention to it. But it will eventually make sure that you, again, and your animators can deliver the material on time because you actually were able to plan for the correct amount of animators to complete a certain amount of material over the course of multiple months. And uh, it basically means that when you take the cross section of the entire uh, episode, so say if you're working on an 11 minute ep uh, episode, I would usually always expect it to come in at around plus minus 200 shots per 11 minutes depending on the style, could be less, could be more. Um, but that's sort of a ballpark. So now you want to make sure that if you divide all these shots up and you kind of take a cross section of how many characters are going to be on screen in, in, an, in an average shot, you really don't want to go above 2.5 unless you make extra accommodations for it in the budget and the schedule, because it becomes very character heavy. And character heavy shows just take more time and usually cost more uh, money as well. So um, try to keep it at 2.5 or less if you have a modest budget. Um, 
the, um, the camera work can also add complexity and cost. So definitely something to define very clearly for everybody. Again, it's also going to give you more consistent results if you're working with multiple storyboard artists to try and define how are we working with the camera here? How are we using, it's my next point here, image composition. You know, Do we want to always bring something in the close foreground, for example, or is this not part of our style? Do we want to have a little bit more of a flat style or very deep style? Or a lot of backgrounds going to be at a three quarter angle or not so much. These things will um, definitely define the look and feel of your show. And so you kind of want to try and define that. It's a natural evolution of the overall style guide that you now hand off to the storyboard artist to help them make good decisions uh, on your behalf. And then you can review it and of course, uh, double check for this. There, the, the last point here is my uh, do not put poses or verboten poses, they sometimes call them. Usually there's uh, poses that are to be avoided uh, for whatever reason, either because you might not like that particular gesture or that particular expression or because somebody else uh, in, the, in the stakeholder group or on the broadcaster side does not like a particular expression. A uh, typical example is if somebody's supposed to be pretty all the time and uh, some expression is deemed as not appealing, then they will tell you not to do that. Angry ex eye expressions can often get called out for material that uh, is made for very young children uh, because there is a fear that angry will upset the children. So it's things like that to be aware of. The animation library, again, it depends very much on the technique that you're using, but it will help build something that your animation team will be thankful for because it will help them use something as a starting point. They don't have to use it one-to-one. -one. They can always alter it a little bit because uh, they might have to. The, the speeds of the walks and runs might vary uh, from shot to shot or, or from sequence to sequence. Um, and the expressions might also need some adjustments, but at least you're giving them a foundation. One thing to bear in mind when you're building a library or thinking of a very complex model pack for a hand-drawn project are hands and feet, because uh, in my experience, hands and feet are one of the most time-consuming things in any hand-drawn or Toon Boom Harmony or Flash production. They usually eat up, uh, believe it or not, the majority of the energy of the animator. So it's a good idea to think ahead for hands and feet and try to build out a, a fairly robust library or at least a set of very strong model sheets for hands and feet. Um, now we're going into the full production and the entire process starts. Now it's, uh, it, it's uh, unleashing in its full potential. Uh, so I've, I've broken that up into six points here. There's the scripts. Um, now you should be getting an episodic uh, script every week or every other week. Um, the design is in full swing. You have to break down the episodes and uh, check that uh, the parameters are being kept that were based on the original assumptions. Um, the voice casting and recording takes place, ideally also every other week or every week. Um, the animatic is usually assembled by an animatic editor based on the storyboards that are starting to get kicked off and then are coming back to you uh, out of the storyboard team. Uh, and of course, eventually the layout animation effects, lighting, compositing start up as well. So now we're going into the full production process. Um, let's look at the episodic scripts here. So I mentioned the production parameters and also the limitations. I'm talking about limitations a lot. What I've learned over the years is that limitations usually re, um, result in much stronger writing because in a way you're forcing the writer to work with the characters that they have. And that usually results in more character-driven entertainment. And that usually is actually much richer entertainment than basing every visual joke on a visual new uh, costume, on a visual new hair, on a visual new um, prop of some kind. Um, these things are quite expensive jokes, and uh, if you compare it side by side with a script that is a little bit more character driven and actually works with the personality of the character, you'll notice that usually the, the, the cheaper script is the stronger script. So it's not always a good idea to just throw whatever at, um, at an episode that you think you can, because in the end, somebody's going to have to design, somebody's going to have to build, and somebody is going to have to animate all these things. So uh, embrace limitations as a source of better creativity. It, it usually works. I've seen it work time and again. 
And so the production parameters, like I said, are the, uh, the natural evolution of the original assumptions when you first planned it out. And now you hopefully you know, we can afford to do one new big location per episode. We can maybe afford to do 20 props per half hour, uh, per, per 11 minute. Uh, maybe it's more, uh, but it's good to know. And maybe there's a way to, if you only did 12 in the one episode, maybe you can do 25 in the next. You know, there's usually some sort of uh, fluctuating uh, give and take between individual episodes. You just have to be careful that in the end, uh, the workload for the design and builds teams does not exceed what is actually uh, possible to do in, in any given week. And so uh, there's a few small little extra pointers here I have. There is uh, usually um, you get um, elements in, in scripts that read very funny, but don't necessarily translate into strong visuals because maybe they're just based on a funny term or a funny expression that the writer uses, but that's actually not visible, right? It's just something that sounds fun when you read it. So always put your director's hat on, try to visual, visualize in front of your mind's eye and see, is this actually going to be funny once it's playing out as a, as a shot in my, in my episode? Um, and always keep your character consistency, right? Always check, ask yourself, is this really something that this person would say? Is this the individual? Again, going back to the idea of character-driven storytelling being the most successful with your audience because people will fall in love with your character, right? They will actually like the character for who this character is and they'll appreciate them for that. Uh, and keep timing your scripts, keep, uh, keep a close eye on this and tell people if you feel it's becoming too long or maybe it's becoming too short and you need a little bit of extra business somewhere. So then the rough design and the, the final design are summarized in a, in a sheet here. Um, the rough design should uh, incorporate anything that the story artist is going to need because as a storyboard artist, you don't want to be tasked with having to design something on the fly while you're also storyboarding. Not usually a good idea because the, it will take time away from the storyboard artist to, for doing their part of the, of the process. They'll have to sacrifice something else and you don't want that. So it's a good idea to try and give them at least a rough concept uh, sketch of every element and also provide them with a size comparison that kind of explains how, how large or small this character, this new object or this new location is going to be. Uh, so they can build that in and, and use it as accurately as possible. Top-down floor plans, I'm a big fan of that because you can really plan your staging in that. You can communicate that clearly from design over towards story, over towards directing. And even people in, in layout and animation can make use of that kind of uh, planning. So it's usually a very helpful tool. And um, you have to think ahead for uh, characters changing costumes or maybe the costume or faces uh, being impacted by mud or any other item, you know, somebody eating berries and he's got a berry mouth or there's all kinds of um, all kinds of ways of how you can have to uh, end up doing a redress for characters so is uh, something to plan ahead for as are stages of props. So if you're actually doing uh, like, say, you're eating a sandwich and the character progressively eats the sandwich while um, while the sequence uh, continues on and, and uh, you see the character talking, you will probably need more than just one bite missing out of the sandwich. And maybe at the beginning, the sandwich is actually completely uh, new with no bite missing yet. So these are kind of things that you better plan for because eventually somebody is going to ask you that question and the director is going to have to have the answer for that. Um, then actually kicking it off into storyboards and animatic, you're going to work walk this through all these little details with the story artist. And you're gonna talk about that sequence by sequence. So you kind of need to make sequence notes and hand that off to the story artist. And uh, you've got to communicate to the story artist whose story is it? Who is actually the, sort of the main person we're, we're following along for this? It, it's not always the main character. Sometimes one of the, the incidental or side characters takes over a little bit and becomes a little bit more integral. And so that needs to be communicated. Who's the sort of the main storyline, the main through line, the A plot here about? And that needs to be something the, the storyboard artist then needs to uh, follow. Um, of course, the story artist needs to understand the entertainment, make sure all the jokes are clearly understood, all the 
you know, there is an actual appreciation of the entertainment there, because if not, you might have to explain that, or maybe it's not the right script for this particular individual, and you can still reshuffle it and give it to somebody who maybe appreciates the entertainment more. Um, and uh, now it's time to walk through all these things, the top-down view of the set, the, the rough designs I was mentioning, all these things. Um, another thing is important is to let the uh, story artists know if you're particularly interested in seeing a certain screen direction happening here. So usually because of the way how we in, the, in, the, in, in, in our part of the world at least work, uh, read from uh, screen left to screen right, usually that direction is considered something that is a little bit of a progressing and somewhat easier passage. Um, if you see a character move from screen right towards screen left, usually you, you feel a little bit more uh, resistance, a little bit more obstacle. So it might be a good idea to plan for that and uh, think ahead and communicate that to the story artist if it is important to you. Um, the character screen average, the um, all the complexities, like I said, that has to be communicated to the story artist. Because at this stage, the story artist will make decisions for you that a lot of other people uh, will have to follow suit on. The layout artists, the animators, uh, everybody will have to uh, work with what is being provided to them as a blueprint um, to now build these shots. So you want to make sure that the parameters are on track. Now, when it comes to layout, you're uh, basically now going into two very different uh, realms. When it's a CG, like a Maya-based show, for example, you're talking about something completely different than when it's a 2D show that's either hand-drawn or maybe uh, har harmony-based or, or flash-based. So these kind of venture off into two different realms. In a 3D sense, it's more about placing a camera in a set that is actually a 3D set. In 2D, it's much about drawing backgrounds and planning for backgrounds and painting the background. So it, it sort of ventures out. So I, I'm going to stay fairly general here. Um, it's basically now um, splitting up into two very different individual handouts or kickoffs, if you want. The first one is about the story and the characters. So here you want everybody moving forward, the layout supervisor, especially the animation director, of course, usually you wanna hand it out to them together if possible. You want them to understand, again, what is the story about? Where's the drama? What do we want to uh, emphasize here? Is there a mood here that needs to be carried through camera placement? Um, and through, uh, through angles in the background, uh, and how can we support that? That's sort of more the creative aspect of the handout, but there's also really technical, which often can take longer to do than the actual storytelling handout, and that handles can, can all kinds of complexities, like effects, for example. Let's discuss who's doing this. Is this going to be something the character animator is going to supply? Is there a dedicated effects animator or does it maybe have to be a combination of both? Or is this really a post thing and it's going to be mostly handled in compositing and you don't want the animators to invest too much time and thought because you feel it's something that can happen completely independently. These things are important to communicate with every uh, everybody involved so people don't uh, end up making mistakes and um, doing the same thing twice, for example. Uh, again, it's about prop and costume continuity. It's about very special lighting scenarios. If there's a moment in time where the lights go dark and there's only eyes or just barely anything visible, for example, or if a red light turns on, if there's candlelight of some sort, you probably want to try and discuss these things. They might need a color key of some sort from the uh, design team, and this might not have been provided. So this is a good time to find out about it and discuss this with the, uh, with the supervisors. Um, the staging challenges are important because sometimes you have something in the animatic where you know it's going to be a restricted area and it's going to be tricky to deal with. So you as the director really have to guide the team through to avoid them running into insurmountable uh, problems later on. And, you know, then they'll, uh, they'll create something that is not high quality on the screen. They want to try and avoid that. So provide them with solutions. Um, so provide them also with answers to questions about high parameter shots. If there's all of a sudden a shot with a whole stadium filled with uh, lots of people, what's the solution here? How is this going to be done, right? How many characters actually have to be animated? Is there a way we can cheat this? Is there a way we can work around this? These things need to be uh, resolved before the artists start working on it. 
And uh, same about uh, staging choices to cut around complex actions. So hopefully there is moments where you don't have to show that a character kneels down and uh, takes off their shoes, for example, which is very hard to do, or uh, somebody uh, puts on a jacket. You know, these things don't need to be shown necessarily. So try to work with the team to avoid unnecessary complexities and focus your efforts on the things that are necessary and that are going to bring, again, the maximum value and the maximum entertainment on the screen. So now as you're going into animation, you will, you're going to see this ideally in two stages. I'm thinking of layout stages as a, as a first initial stage that will be uh, the, the starting point, but then as it, the animators take over, um, they will show it to you as a posing pass and then eventually as an animation pass. And you really want to see it at both stages because at the posing pass, you can influence how the storytelling is coming across, how the, uh, the choices are being made for expressions and acting poses, um, how the story is being told and how the characters are being portrayed. And it's a good idea to give them feedback at that point if you feel something isn't working right. Ideally, you try to do this in what I like to call a moving forward note. So I attach a lot of moving forward notes that are posing pass when I see that something needs to be changed, but I don't think it needs to be changed right now and done as part of the posing pass again. Uh, it might be something that you can add for the animator to take care of as they take it into the animation pass. So posing pass being basically just the key poses that carry the action and tell the core of the story. And then as it goes in animation, it's more about how is it happening, how fast is it happening, how much time is being dedicated to each piece of this uh, action on the screen, and is this going to communicate clearly to the audience. So it shifts a little bit from the initial um, how was it staged to how is it being executed. Those are two kind of different ways to look at it, and I think it's important to try and uh, deal with these uh, notes in two different stages. At that point, you really don't have much of a choice. Uh, eventually the animator is going to get your notes and is going to have to implement that. But ideally you've already discussed also the core acting choices at posing time. So these don't have to be reiterated anymore. Uh, and of course effects against something not to be dis, uh, completely disregarded depends on the style and nature of your show. This might be a very simple a show that does not need real effects and then it's a non-issue. If it's a very busy action adventure show, you might need that and you, you want to plan ahead and think about it. Uh, and then of course come the final steps. Now it's already fairly fa far along. Um, now I'm breaking this up into four blocks. There is a, a music block. The director should write some music spotting notes um, so that the, uh, the, the storytelling, the mood, Music is basically the way how you can make the audience feel like you want them to feel. And uh, in some cases, how you want to make sure that the character is perceived to be feeling. So the music controls the mood and the emotion of your storytelling. So it's very important. So you have to write some notes towards the person that handles the music to try and implement that in the right time, in the right place. Very important there is when to not have music because usually when you uh, provide gaps where the dialogue carries and the sound design carries, um, then it will result in a stronger storytelling. If you do what they like to call a wall-to-wall -wall music pass, usually you lose clarity and you lose a little bit of, uh, of storytelling intensity. Sound design is the opposite uh, part of the, of, the, of the sound wall. Where, wherever the music does not carry, you usually want some sound design to carry. And that means sound effects, uh, Foley. Uh, so something that a person specifically creates, but it can also come from uh, a CD um, that provides a high quality music of, uh, sound effects of some sort. Um, and so now you can sort of create that. So again, because you're planning for the mood and the emotion to be explained as part of the music pass, you also want to make sure that you plan for the sound design to create storytelling clarity and also likely comedy. It's a lot of comedies being carried through this, but also sometimes uh, scary moments, right? So um, you want to clarify that. But again, try to think of both as almost like a balance of uh, the same thing. You want to, you don't want to plan for 
the drama to be carried by music and the sound effects to to carry the uh, carry the drama at, uh, as well you know it doesn't work it's better to dedicate and clearly differentiate that because this is being handled usually by two different people so you as the director want to make sure you control that where is the uh, where's the emphasis here is it music or is it sound design and then the final mix brings it all together that's hopefully when you're sitting in there and you can help control the levels and bring that all together so the cohesive result hopefully will bring the, the the clarity to the storytelling and will bring the right mood and emotion across and then it goes to color and post so last opportunity to create uh, consistencies you might be able to tweak the colors if there is some sort of color differences some color shifting happening and of course we want to make sure that from a technical standpoint everything is broadcast safe and broadcast proof so there's black and white levels that need to be considered and all kinds of other technical um, technical finishes that you want to make sure you leave to somebody, a, a post-production supervisor, ideally, um, who can keep an eye on that for you so that the broadcaster uh, or, and their technical team won't have any issues with uh, what you're delivering to them um, on the due dates. And that takes me to the end of my uh, presentation. I hope that you found that interesting. I hope that there was something in there for you. And I think uh, what we want to do now is do a little question and answer session. Uh, so please let me know if you have any questions that I can uh, go over with you. And hopefully we can uh, learn some additional stuff together. I'm curious to hear your guys' thoughts about my presentation. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.